Hi, everybody. Welcome. It's uh, Friday night, 7 p.m. Mountain Daylight Time. My name is Mr. Summers, and I am glad to be back here uh, this evening to uh, chat with my dear friend, longtime friend, longtime um, musician, bandmate, and, and in, in a myriad of different situations, the incredible bass player and jazz impresario. Please welcome Mr. Cody Hutchinson. Cody, you there? Absolutely. Of course I'm here, Johnny. You don't, hey, think, I, you don't think I left already? Yeah, because we didn't uh, check at all before we went live that everything was working. Yeah, it's here. <laughs> How are you doing, man? Uh, not too bad. Not too bad. You know, just living the dream. It's weird. It's still weird. I mean, I mean, I guess um, in different locations. I know uh, friends of ours in New York and in New Orleans and in other parts of the world. I have friends in Korea. They're playing constant. Everything's open. Everything's going. But uh, but here we're still at the tail end of vaccinations enough. And they announced that we're going to be opening. Um, and I know you and me and uh, all the players we play with are, are just ready to get back to work, aren't we? It would be nice. It would be nice to, to get to, to be with other human beings again. Although, you know, I have really got to know my house and uh, <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. I said at the beginning of this, I think I, I put it on a Facebook status once. I was like, wow, so we're locked down. I really think this is going to be not two weeks, but a year and a half, which means my house will never be this clean and nobody will ever see it. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes. Um, yes. Uh... I know at least the second part of that's true. Um, so what, uh, what have you been doing over the, over the last year and a half? Because f for... Uh, for everyone listening, especially if you 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 uh, might not know Cody, but I mean, you and I would see each other all the time. We'd be um, playing in uh, a lot of my groups and the C the Calgary Jazz Orchestra, as well as um, going to to shows that you of bands that you were playing in and seeing you play with other great players, and uh, as well as the you know the Jazz YYC Festival and all the things going on. Like we went from that to to where we are. So what have you been up to? What have I been up to? Well, as you mentioned, um, I've been putting on a lot of shows, uh, probably about 60 virtual presentations over the last year through the Calgary Jazz Festival's Jazz YYC. Just wrapped up a festival last night, as a matter of fact, and looking to plan one for this summer. Um, what else have I been doing? Teaching online. Uh, I've been doing a lot of school workshops, um, a few uh, Jazz 101s, which I do quite often through CKUA Radio, where I host a time for jazz. Uh, hmm. Releasing some albums on my record label with my wife, uh, Chronograph Records. And uh, for the most part, uh, keeping an eye on a tiny three-year-old who at any point during this video could come flying in here clothed or unclothed because she's three and she does what she wants. Yeah. Um... And she's adorable too. My goodness, um, yeah. it's been weird actually not to see her over this last year. Um, but uh, at least I've seen photos and and gotten some FaceTimes with her. Um, okay, so let's talk a bit about you, because you are uh, astoundingly interestingly. And if you're not astoundingly interesting, we're gonna pretend you are. So well, you're you're interesting to uh, I'm interesting, I guess to to you, I suppose. To me, yes. To everybody else, uh, this is a good time to. Just go get a drink. No. Um, so where were you born and raised? Born and raised in Calgary, Alberta. Okay. And why music? What got you started and hooked on playing? Why music? What got me started and hooked on playing? Um, I still don't know. <laughs> I, was, uh, I was 11 years old. <laughs> a mistake, was it? <laughs> I don't know. I never <laughs> thought I was going to be a professional musician. And uh, here I am 20 odd years later, and I guess I'm a professional musician. Well, maybe you'll choose something else when you grow up. Well, you can only do one. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, no, I, uh, I yeah, when I was, I was 11 years old, I was at an elementary school that had, a, was one of the last ones in Calgary that had a string program. And I remember at the time, 
um, you know, small class, 20, 30 kids, and they started handing out instruments and they gave the double bass to the tallest kid in the class. I was the second tallest kid in the class. So they gave me a cello, which at the time I just hated. I remember taking it home. I would walk home from school in the winter with it in its little cloth bag. And I just think back, I'm like, oh, what a horrible kid I was. I used to drag it in the snow like a toboggan. And, so and, uh, <laughs> and but I just, I, I don't know what it was. From that moment on, I just was kind of like, I don't, maybe it was just stubbornness. Someone said I couldn't, I wasn't allowed to play the bass because I wasn't tall enough. And so I just kept, you know, I was obsessing, which is not a typical uh, thing for professional musicians, any kind of OCD or ADD. <laughs> yeah. So, um, but yeah, I, I just, I wanted to play it. I went to a junior high. We'd moved when I went to junior high and the school, I showed up late. They gave me a euphonium because I was three days late. And it was like the, well, this is what you get, kids. So I'm like, ah, I got the cello because it was this is what you get. I got the euphonium because this is what you get. Uh, and uh, they had a really, really bad double bass, like many junior high schools do still in the city, sitting in a cupboard with strings that were so high, I could put my entire arm underneath them in the fingerboard. And I remember when I was... 14, okay, so for everybody fighting to learn it. For everybody yeah. listening that isn't a bass player, when the strings are are far away from from if this is the the neck board and this these are the strings when the strings are far away and especially when you're a child and you have little hands, but even for professionals, that means you need way more strength and technique to pull that string and press it against the board to create your sound and try to sound in tune and good tone, right? So in other mm -hmm. words, those are extremely difficult to play. Yeah, so that one was virtually impossible. But when I was in grade, started grade nine, I fought and fought through it to teach myself how to play Stand By Me on the bass. Okay, and good too. Yeah, yeah, but I still was the euphonium player. I was a pretty good euphonium player. Like I was yeah. a good euphonium player up until my early 20s. Um, but Can you play something for us on the euphonium right now? Well, I don't have euphonium, Johnny. <laughs> Somewhere in here, I have a black trombone that you've loaned me uh, yeah. that I can still get an octave and a half out of, thank goodness. Why don't you play um, a song on that then for us? I don't know what the mouthpiece is. We're still unpacking. That's my uh -huh. excuse today. Um, we moved <laughs> We moved in uh, just before the new year and uh, have been renoed and slowly unpacking. So, yeah, by this time next year, I should have found it. Um, but anyway, long, long story longer. Uh, I ended up uh, in grade nine playing euphonium. And then one day the band teacher, a great band teacher named uh, Robert George, who was a bassoonist, uh, still out there. With, who knows? He might be tuned in. Um, and a very inspiring person, inspired me music uh, immensely. And uh, he said, hey, our bass player quit in our jazz band. Does anybody here want to play? And I, before I even finished it, my hand shot up. I'm like, me, 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 me. And then... Um, my mom was my mom was very interesting. She's like, well, if you're going to do this, you need to take lessons. So she got me lessons. Um, and actually, funny thing is, that my my first bass teacher wasn't a bass player, but he uh, his son um, Malcolm. He and I have been like really great friends since we were teenagers. So eh, long story sh longer, I ended up taking up the bass when I was in grade nine. Played electric bass all the way through high school, and then in grade twelve took up the thing that you see over my shoulder there and uh the rest the CKUA is history. hockey jersey yes the hockey jersey yeah, okay. is what i started playing actually i did play hockey until i was uh 16 17 uh, yeah anyway um so took up the double bass i went to school for business got a business degree uh, but I was playing so much. I'm, I'm still, it's kind of funny. Uh, Jeremy Brown, the head at the time when I was there, the head of the UFC music program, um, he has me listed on the UFC music alumni page. I actually asked him about it the other day. I'm like, you know, I'm not an alumni. I have a business degree. He's like, and he's, care. he's like, yeah, you're one of the few professional musicians that came out of the school. So, uh, and you played in every band I ever conducted. And I'm but like, yeah, okay. And to be fair, you played in all the bands and, and experienced yeah. that, and you were taking lessons. But, but I want to go back to your mom because that's a pretty, that's a pretty astutely intelligent thing your mother did, which was, oh, you want to play. Now, e even at the beginning, right at the beginning when you played, uh, as you started wanting to play or showed an instrument, um, an interest in something, you, mm -hmm. you had a parent that said, we need to get you lessons. That's, yeah. that's astutely intelligent because it's, it's not the norm. 
um, if someone's in a band program, which are amazing, of course, but when someone's in a band program, they usually think, well, they'll, they'll learn that at the band program. Um, well, she said too, though, I, uh, she, she said part of it was that I had never bugged her for anything more in my life. I was just <laughs> okay. nonstop. I'm like, I want to get lessons. I want to get lessons. And my mom was like, well, we'll, we'll get you lessons to see if you're serious about this. And then uh, years later, I talked to my first bass teacher who was really, because he wasn't a bass player. He was very much about technique, technique, technique. He's like, I want to make sure I get your hands right. And I talked to him years later and he said, yeah, like I, you studied with me for um, a year and I just knew that you had gone past where I, I could take you. And so I put you to the next teacher. And that was uh, John Hyde, who was, was the head of the Mount Royal uh, Conservatory Jazz Program at the time. Mm -hmm. And he, um, or Mount Royal College, sorry, mm -hmm. at the time. And he taught me until I was uh, 18. And then I said, well, I want to take up double bass and I want you to teach me. And John had been in the uh, Edmonton Symphony. He was a great double bass player, still is, lives out on the Vancouver Island. And he basically said, you need to go study with a classical player for two years, get your conservatory. And if you do that, you can come back and I'll teach you how to play jazz on an upright bass. And, and, and uh, so I don't know if he you thought I was actually going to do it, but then, as you know, <laughs> And so he technique. wanted you to get technique because just someone that, that really knew the technique of the instrument. Yes. Yeah. Yes. And, and he's somebody who, you know, he taught me in that moment as a teacher, there's a moment when you're teaching a student where uh, sometimes you'll have a student. I've had a couple who like, I have students who have masters and doctorates uh, in classical and jazz. And there's a point where you have to say, maybe I need to send you to somebody else to yeah. get um, a different, a different look at things. So absolutely, I um, I agree hundred percent. I I I agree with that hundred percent. But that's because he's a wise teacher who's doing what's right for his students, as opposed to trying to keep a student. Now, John, um, mm -hmm. I was lucky to study with John. He taught classes um, when I did my jazz degree at the university, and then, um, and then, uh, I still get to play with him when when I tour out to the island. Um, mm -hmm. He's a beautiful musician. Um, oh, yeah. Okay, so, um, so that, that that brings me up something too. Now, your dad Ken Hutchinson was an extremely successful architect. Architect, uh, he designed hundreds of buildings across Western Canada. And Thirty-five hundred. That well, that's hundreds. Yeah, sure. <laughs> it's thirty-five hundreds. Um, yes. Yeah. Right. So, wow, thirty-five hundred. Um, and if that's where we stop counting. Yeah, it's like that's enough. You've you've done enough. Yeah. Um, so there's so much creativity in that. Did he influence you, like seeing that and seeing his? I remember you told me stories about uh, uh, one of my favorite stories. You told me about him when you were a kid, and he was selling a project, and he the person would be talking about this building that he wanted, and your dad would be drawing it drawing something that the guy couldn't see on the table and he'd be drawing 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 as as he's listening to the person the individual and then he would put it on the table because he drew it upside down and he'd slide it over to the person so he wouldn't even have to turn it around and go something like this and and you know of course blow people's minds that's that's amazing um did that level of of uh, of ability and and kind of like artistic uh sensibility that your dad had did that did that influence you seeing that like just seeing that high level can't not um i i actually at my at my dad's funeral a couple of years ago um my producer from ckua radio david ward who was uh, used to be the producer for cbc tonic um he we we kind of did a little my, my sister and i and uh, my uncle and uh, we did a bit of a talk on my dad's background in history and at the end of the at the, a day or two after the funeral uh, david ward looks at me and he goes okay after finding out about your dad you make a lot more sense to me <laughs> because i uh i'm i'm you know people have old overscheduled kids i'm the overscheduled adult but my dad was high level um he was he was a you know he was a big guy six foot eight Mm -hmm. um, and he is, he was a commanding presence and he was talented and, you know, um, I, re I remember someone asking me who my, my, who I looked up to and who I wanted to be when I grew up, when I was in my early twenties, I was like, my dad, I want to be like my dad. 
um, he achieved stuff. And he was one of the things that my sister and I both learned. And my sister, like last week, was just made the president of the Alberta Association of Architects. Wow, um, Kisa. She, she's, yeah, yeah. She's uh, up until earlier this year was running the Alberta Cancer Center, the $1.2 billion building at, uh, the, at the hospital and now runs a, a firm in, in Calgary. Um, that does high rises <laughs> like she's she's she and I both learned the same thing from my dad is like rather than wait um, for something to happen just go and do it uh, mm -hmm. so and that's what my, my my mom and my dad would do they would just go and do things you know oh hey uh, we don't think that charity is making enough money okay we're going to start our own charity that raises money for them and they you know they raise like three hundred thousand dollars in a night for Amazing. like six or seven years in a row, wow. things like that, where he was just like, this is what you do. Like r rather than sit there and bemoan something doesn't exist or whatever, go do it. So that's, you, you know. Well, you, you've you through your career, you know that resonates in me and my thoughts on, on especially on the arts. And, and I know that resonates in you. Um, the So the uh, my volume's low I'm hearing, is it better now? Is this okay? It seems a little bit higher. You can probably go a bit more, I think. A little bit more? I have, yeah, I have Can I get more phones. of me and everybody else's monitors, please? This is, I Thank know you. you don't usually hear this. Turn up, Johnny. Turn up. Yeah. Yeah. Normally it's turn down and go home. Um, That's right. Cool. Okay. So. Uh, well, don't yell as soon as you get your volume <laughs> up. <laughs> um, okay. So let's let's take a, take a little bit of time here. Let's learn about the bass as an instrument. You are a bass specialist. Okay. Okay. Nobody, this no is musician where goes to get a drink or goes to the bathroom. Yeah, it's like a bass solo. Everybody goes to the, you know, to the washroom, orders a new drink at the bar, that kind of thing. Yeah. Um, so let's learn about the bass. What, what is the role? What do you see yourself as the role of the bass player in a band? What do I see the role of the bass player? Uh, um, to just try and make everybody else sound good. To do my bidding. So if I sound bad, it's it's uh, it's on you. No, 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 it's on you. No. <laughs> but I do. I can. I can at least fool people into thinking that you're sounding good. Oh, you've been the secret all these years, then, for me. I think. Um, so you make everybody. You make everybody sound. I'm just going to adjust my volume a little bit down now. Okay. So you make everybody sound. Uh, better so when you say that what do you mean like what are the things you're focusing on and the things that you find important for a bass player so like if you're saying to a young bass player or a hobbyist bass player um that that wanted to play more and up their game and move into the professional realm or just for someone listening that goes what is it that the bass does like i know that it looks bigger than a cello maybe they know that maybe like i think it looks it probably burns longer than a cello yeah it um, floats too i don't floats. understand why that guy on the titanic didn't just paddle off i've never understood that but there was also room for what's his name dicaprio on the thing so jack could have fit on that he could have fit yeah it was a we're gonna time. do an entire episode on the titanic and the musicians yeah, yeah. um it was a real pleasure playing with you guys let's not float on our instruments yeah. um that would wreck them um so uh, like, what are the things that someone should really focus on to be a solid bass player? Solid bass player, upright bass or electric? Uh, well, let's let's start with upright. Upright, uh, time, tuning, and tone. Yeah, the, right. The three T's. Number one is time. Mm -hmm. If you have good time, people will like to play with you. Metronomes are your friend. Mm -hmm. uh, tuning, that's like. That's huge, and that that's a big part is your technique, right? If if you've got good hands and good approach to the instrument, you'll be uh, you'll you'll be more in tune. And then uh, tone, right? And that's where character, like tone, is. I'd actually be straight up. Tone isn't as important at first. If you just want to play with people and they're happy, <laughs> it's in the order of you know time, tuning, then tone. Yeah. Uh, but tone is kind of like character in your sound. Right. So who do you want to sound like? What um, you know? Do you want to sound like Ray Brown? Do you want to sound, uh, you know, like Esperanza Spalding? Do you want to sound like who, name name bass players left, right, and center? And as you know, as a jazz musician, that's spending time on the instrument, listening to them. So for me, there were two bass players that come out in my sound. I think 
Um, number one was Charlie Hayden, who mm -hmm. I, because I started later and I, I didn't think I was a technician. I, uh, I went to, I had a teacher who said, well, check out Charlie Hayden. He doesn't really play very fast or anything, but he sounds amazing. And so I did. Uh, and then Ray Brown, who uh, is, you know, arguably one of the historical figures on bass, which the best part is I met Charlie Hayden and man, did he hate Ray Brown. He just, <laughs> he thought he was the worst thing that ever happened to bass. No. So oh. that actually, that was really entertaining for me. The first time I met the, met, you know, one of my heroes and then someone mentioned one of my other heroes and he just went off on how much he just couldn't stand. Him. That's people. I, yeah. uh, I mean, Ray Brown, as you know, is one of my heroes. He's, he's, I actually have, um, when I'm working with a student and we're talking about groove, I have them um, lift Ray Brown bass lines, especially that track from Live at Scholar's Freddie Freeloader uh, with Gregory Hutchinson on drums and Benny Green on piano. I know you and I both just love that album to pieces. And the, because we've talked about it forever. Actually, I remember once we were playing a gig, um, just a few years after we met, we were playing a gig somewhere and you were like, Come here, I got this album. I got you. To, you got to check out. You got to come check out this album. And we went back on the break to your. Was that a green Honda Civic or a, a green Volkswagen, green Volkswagen Golf. Golf? Yeah. Okay. So we went back to your Golf. First new car I ever bought. <laughs> and we went back to that, and it was amazing. You could get a double bass in it. We went back to that, and I remember you. You put that record on, and went, "Yeah, man, I know. Like, this is one of my favorites." But I send students to listen to Freddie Freeloader. So anyone checking, listening right now, uh, check out. Live at Scholars, S-C-U-L-L-E-R-S, -L -L -E the uh, Ray Brown Trio. Uh, the whole record's amazing. But there's the, you just, I think it's because of the way the, the mix is. Like you can hear his bass so forefront and uh, that I love that track. But um, okay, so when you say time, can we also add groove in there? Because to me, when I hear a bass player, I want to hire a bass player. It's, it's how they swing or how they pocket or how they groove. Yeah, yeah, really and to me, to me, that that's kind of part and parcel with time. But I know, for like, for example, if you're a classical musician trying to take up jazz, then we're going to be talking about sound and feel. Because um, I was actually talking to a student about this earlier this week. Um, for example, when I go to Europe to play, um, there's a distinctly different sound amongst, uh, in especially in swing. Mm -hmm. from musicians there and it for us it doesn't sit as well in a lot of cases like obviously there's world-class players in europe who swing 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 but from a, a larger kind of ecosystem look at, at the music you hear a lot of musicians who uh, the swing isn't the same it, and it's probably it's you know i've felt in conversations with those players it's massively based around like the huge classical tradition and and for some players if you're not steeped in jazz you're not surrounded by people who can swing um it it definitely feels different and uh you know for example i just saw in the chat brendan lynn mcelroy great bass player um hey brendan and, and video gamer don't mess with him online i'll crush you uh but uh <laughs> but yeah like you know when you hear north american players we have a different feel than overall than we may be in Europe or Asia or, you know, d name different regions, countries, that type of thing. There's a different feel. Like there is a somewhat different feel to Canadian players and American players, but there's something similar as well in that that pocket that uh, that exists, you know, uh, probably just from the, the North American tradition and going through that history of jazz and having it around you more. Absolutely. Um, so, We've got uh, the upright. Can you just in like a couple minutes show people the two instruments, the upright bass and the electric bass, and just explain the difference just a little? I suppose. One <laughs> moment. My sound might change a bit because I have to switch over to uh, exterior. Monsters. No worries. While we do that, um, got some comments here. Uh, please type, ask questions. Hi, Bob. Hopefully you can hear us better now. No. Klaus, thank you. Thank you. Klaus, Klaus, nice to see you. you. Um, Christoph, uh, oh, the, the treasure behind you. Behind oh, the trumpets. the trumpets. I will. I will. Maybe, not Maybe not this time, time but, I, but I, I, will. I will. I have a lot of uh, vintage horns and horns that I like, so. Maybe I should just do a thing by myself. 
right. have a piano player come over so we can play. And uh, uh, Brendan, Brandon, nice to see you, man. We need to play together again soon. I hope you're doing well. Um, okay. okay, so, so the, upright the upright and the electric. And the electric. So, so one small, one is big. Same color, though. Do you like the t how matchy match they are? Uh, it's, uh, it's staggeringly, staggeringly uh, gorgeous. gorgeous. Um, um, so, so <laughs> one would one save would you save on, the on the Titanic better. better. Yeah. Um, this one's the paddle. This one's the boat. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's uh, why that's you, why need, you to. need to. The, uh, okay, okay, so, so tell, us tell us about tone generation, tone generation on the difference, on the difference uh, in the difference, the difference between, between the two of them. Um, oh, how do I put it? tone generation on? I feel like tone generation on this bass is more uh, settings and your right hand. Your so right hand, fingers, meaning the, the technique. The fingers you pluck the strings right, with. Right. Okay. On the upright bass, most upright players will agree that it's your left hand. This is okay. where okay. this is where you're gonna get your your tone from. Okay. So okay. it's a different thing now. Obviously, this your right hand on the upright as well. It's distorting, well, distorting just, a, just little a little bit. You're welcome. So, but uh, on the up, on the upright, it's it's really your left hand. Right hand gives you your attack. Left hand gives you your tone. So, cool, um, cool. The, the difference is too. So here we go. Fun facts. Like I said, for anyone who needs to take a nap, here you go. So these are frets. These little spaces. Fret, 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 fret. On the electric bass, one, two, three, four. Each finger gets a fret. On that distance, on an upright bass, is only one, two, three notes. So the upright bass, you have to have, uh, how do I put it? You have to be more efficient to play this than you do to play the electric. So that's that's all I got for that. Cool. cool. Do you want to play us a little something while you have that up? Okay, we'll see. Uh, here, you can name this song for me. I was not expecting you to play that song. I think uh, maybe in a few minutes you and I should try to play something together. Uh, Johnny, I, I, I don't know why I wore a jacket tonight. It's just it's it's just the wrong thing to do. So, uh, oh, uh, shameless promotion for you. <laughs> My favorite sports car shop right there. What? Next performance. Oh, what? I, I couldn't. Oh, this, oh, this whole thing? I couldn't this possibly thing? be sucking up. I was looking for a shirt tonight, and I was like, oh, oh look what I have. Oh, i got to make sure it's in frame for you. And uh, no, wow, folks, I'm cool, not getting cool. paid to do this. Wow. wow. So, Very cool. Very cool. Um, um, for anyone who doesn't know, I, I'm a huge uh, race, race car, car sports, sports car, car driving, driving fan. fan. I love I racing, racing and driving. And, driving. and so does Cody, I know, and we've, we've gotten to do a little bit of that together in the past. Man, I hope we get to do more of that coming up too. I'm um, done with the whole car racing thing. Yeah, that's it. You're done. I got a minivan, man. How am I gonna race that? I had to sell my my Subaru. <sighs> uh, well, there are more Subaru. There are plenty of Subarus in the sea. Wait, is that? There are. There are. It's probably not very environmentally friendly. I'm, but... I'm fairly sure I'll be allowed to look at something like that in 15 to 20 years. Um, keep telling yourself that. So. Uh, As my daughter is three. What is okay? So ra some rapid fire questions about the bass. What is one of the most challenging things to learn as a bass player? The string names. Wow. 
That was apparently. Be- I'm just I'm just going from the lessons that I've had to do in the last couple of years. Um, <laughs> once you get past that, golden, you're going to pretty much be a great bass player. Um, That's all like there is to it, folks. Yeah, four, you know the joke. You, you know the joke, right? Uh, kid showed up for a bass lesson. So on the first lesson, I taught him the E string. Went back, came back on the next lesson, taught him the A string. And the third lesson came back, taught him the D string. Fourth lesson, kid didn't come back. Got a gig. But a bump. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. No. Yeah, I can see it. Um, actually, the tough the toughest thing. Actually, someone for- just wrote me their uh they just hired me to play bass on, on piano, so I, I have to run. Uh, nice. It's been yeah, a pleasure. Yeah. It's been a pleasure. Um, yeah, yeah. I see. I see. Brendan is uh, at the peanut gallery tonight. Um, yeah, learning how to cope with being a bass player. Nice. I like that. <laughs> um, okay. So, what do you want? Do you want the toughest thing? I'll tell you what the toughest thing is. Yes. The shape of your hand. Getting if you can get the shape of your hand on electric bass and the shape of your hand on the upright bass together. That uh, to me is one of the tougher things for young players to learn. And as soon as they get that going, then they start to have like exponential uh, growth. If they can't, you know, if I see a kid going one finger up and down the neck, thumb wrapped around the neck, I'm, and they won't stop doing that, I'm like, well, I, I kind of know what you're going to be. I know how good you're going to be or how, how good you're not going to be. Yeah, um, it's going yeah. it's going to stifle you. You're going to plateau really quickly. As a well, it's like playing trumpet. It's basically saying, well, you don't want to learn how to use your embouchure or put air through the horn and you can only play a, an octave on your horn. Well, you know, have fun in your basement. Yeah, there's mm-hmm. uh, there are things that make it easier and learning technique. It's, it's got to be the same on every instrument. Mm-hmm. Yeah, like saxophone. Brand, Brandon saxophone's is, easy. Like, did you hear Richard Harding last week? What he did is so easy. I tuned in right when <laughs> Richard was talking to nobody. As, <laughs> as, I, as you had both screens up yeah. and you weren't there. And nope. Richard was having a lovely conversation with himself. So I, uh, I went back and listened to that part. Um, yeah. life, life sometimes happens and you have to take care of life. Okay, so. Um, I thought it was a who, really heavy duty, like next level deep thinker interview show. So what am I going to do? I'm just going to leave you on the screen. I'm and so far ahead talk. of you, you. You don't even understand. You don't even understand. The levels of my intellect. So, so deep. Uh, who are your favorite bass players that you hear in your sound when you play? My favorite, who I hear in my sound when I play. Mm-hmm. Uh, well, like I mentioned, uh, Charlie Hayden. Charlie Hayden. Ray Brown. Okay. Uh, I love John Patitucci. Yep. Um, I am a fan of Paul Chambers. Okay. Uh, love Jody Prosnick's playing. Um, okay, so let's talk about those five. Best Charlie, uh, for, for people to listen to, they should check out what Charlie Hayden album. Depends what, depends what they're into. No, no, Char- no, no, your recommendation. Uh, the album that I really loved that I did a lot of transcribing and, you know, learning his solos and his playing mm-hmm. was a uh, haunted heart from Quartet West. Haunted heart. Okay. Uh, Ray Brown, best album to check out Ray Brown's playing. Oscar Peterson. We get requests. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. You get a point for that one. Uh, Although best one. Scholars, Scholars is great too, but the yeah. Oscar Peterson one, he can't beat. Exactly. The, uh, um, Paul Chambers. Paul Chambers, Ooh, that's a tricky one. I like bass on top uh, for like getting super nerdy. Okay, so that's fine. You were allowed. And uh, uh, John Patitucci. John Patitucci. Okay, this one. This so P- Patitucci is a little more difficult because Patitucci is one of the few world class doublers, which is why I play still play electric at a reasonably high level and why I still. Uh, you know, like I, why I play both. Now, when you uh, say doublers, meaning acoustic and electric. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's not as common. Not a ton of electric players play upright well and vice versa. And one of the big things for me that, because I started as an electric player, um, I don't like hearing bass players who I can tell which instrument they play when they're playing the other one. So if you right. play electric bass and you sound like an upright player or vice versa, I, it's not my, my thing. I want, I want to try and sound like I play that instrument. So, you know, that would be, that would be what I strive for, but Patitucci does that. So 
he has albums where he's like crazy on the electric bass, where it's mostly electric bass, and then he has albums where he's he's on upright bass. So I have to pick two albums with John Patitucci. Um, my favorite one, because he has a solo on it that just is so musical, is an album called Mistura Fina, mm-hmm. which is when he went to Brazil. Um, and then I love uh, Heart of the Bass, mm. which is where he delves into classical, but he plays this three-part symphony on upright and electric, where I'm just like, yep, there you go. And then he plays uh, the Bach cello suites on electric bass. So I don't, what more do you want? Wow. I'm just going to write that one. I don't know that one. Heart of the Bass. Cool. I'm going to make a note of that. Okay. Um, and Jody Prosnick, the great Jody Prosnick, uh, bass player my, from Vancouver. Well, she's, she's you know... Um, like if you just want to listen to a great album, listen to her album Sun Songs. Sun Songs. Yeah. On a Juno. But that is not my my uh, my favorite album of hers. My favorite album is a group that she had called Triology, which was herself, Miles Black on piano and Bill Coon on guitar, where they play like it's like the Oscar Peterson trio, and you hear what a badass Jody is. And I I I'll you know, my Jody story is this. I fell in love with her playing when I was seventeen. Because she was at the National Music Fest in Winnipeg. And uh, fun fact, and this came up in my mind today, because you know we were, my wife and I drove past uh, Ernest Manning High School in Calgary. And there was, uh, it was obviously some very structured uh, photo and graduation thing for the high school students. And I felt, you know, I felt awful for them. I'm like, okay, this is your graduation. Go stand in the field, get a photo, hug your parents get out of here, next person in. Um, but, you know, that was going on. And I, but I said to my wife, you know, I was like, well, I missed my graduation. I was in Winnipeg playing at the Nationals uh, and uh, watching Jody Prosnick um, edge out Dave Pierce, who, you know, produces Michael Buble and just was a, a ridiculous drummer uh, growing up, still is. Yeah. And, uh, but she's this, this tiny, tiny person. She had to stand, she actually had a milk crate that she stood on and she played a solo where I just shook my head and I was like, you gotta be kidding me. She just killed everyone. She was so good. And uh, she still is. She's, you know, she's a world-class player in Canada. Yeah. Yeah. So there. So so Triology. Triology. Everyone check that out. Okay. Yeah. And Uh, I love her version of a song called Adenac, which is of course Canada spelled backwards. That's a good piece of trivia. Okay. So, um, what is your current favorite album that you're listening to now? Only one. What are you listening to right now? Oh, that's hard. Thing is, the thing is, doing the CKUA radio gig, I listen to a lot of music. I like, know. I know. All what, over the place. Is there one that you put on when you're just like, I just want to hear some great music right now in the last few weeks? Um, what's the name of the album? I can't remember the name of the album. It's pianist named Aaron Goldberg. Oh yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Although I've been listening to to a lot of Emmett Cohen. Oh, he sounds too. great, doesn't he? Goodness. Oh yeah, so. yeah, yeah. He's he's, uh, you know. Well, let's um, let's talk a little bit about uh, your recordings, your trio, the Hutchinson Andrew Trio's current album, uh, Hollow Trees. I believe that's that's still your most current, right? Um, yeah, 2017. Adds, seems like eons ago. Adds that it does. Gosh. Uh, adds the Lily String Quartet to original songs by Chris Andrew uh, to combine classical chamber music with the drive and interplay of jazz. Uh, it's fantastic. Um, I encourage listeners, anyone checking this out, to uh, deep listen the record or even a song from Hollow Trees. Uh, it's fantastic. It's rec- the, the recording quality is actually fantastic as well. The sound quality is amazing on this record. Um, and uh, if they were to deep listen, you know, close their eyes, just soak into one song from that record, which would be the one that you would want them to listen to? That's a good question. Um, oh, what is it? Um, I have to, I honestly can't remember all the names of the songs. Does that make me a bad person? Uh, I can remember Mantaka, everyone else's albums. Oasis, Life Without, Wilds, Peaceful, Music Box. Bur- is it Baroque? Uh, baroque we call it baroque baroque. okay okay so it's like baroque karaoke um that but it is good it is a baroque piece yes never really caught on baroque karaoke um that that album chris was uh 
he was working on his undergraduate. Um, so the you know the funny thing is he was teaching at Grant McEwen University, um, but he didn't have a university degree, which obviously to get tenure and all those things, you need to have a master's degree. So he made the decision after many years to any, and there was a change in the department head there that allowed him to do it, to go get his undergrad degree while teaching at the school. And then he, um, he was really into different classical techniques and, and writing for string quartet as part of a project there. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of spilled over into Hutchinson, Andrew and um, our drummer, Carl Schwanick, his wife, Andrea had a beautiful string quartet. So we thought, well, this makes sense. Let's, let's try this out. We did some shows. We had so much fun. We recorded an album, but the songs that he did uh, were, were, yeah, quite beautiful. I think, you know, if I was to go from, I, I like Mintaka. We've recorded it actually twice. Um, the first time he did it on our album Prairie Modern with a percussionist from Manhattan School named Rogerio Picado. Good friend and, of yours. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And it was just literally the two of them. And it's still one of my favorite things ever done on any of our albums because I'm not playing on it. <laughs> um, and then and then he did Mintaka with the string quartet. Same thing. I wasn't playing on that one. But it was really interesting because he used the string quartet as the percussion section. Mm -hmm. So they had to use extended techniques to try and sound like a Brazilian percussionist. They probably, me... probably love that challenge too. They're such great musicians in the, the Louis oh, yeah. Quartet. Yeah. I can tell you that was, and as far as the recording session went, um, getting four classical musicians to play, uh, you know, Latin rhythms on their instruments like percussion, that was some interesting, it was, it took some work. It took some work to get them into that world. Imagine. Yeah. It's, it's not, not something they had as much experience with, I assume. Yeah. The, uh, the, okay. So I'm going to play a little bit about, uh, I just brought this up here. I'm going to play a little bit of it. Um, if you're listening to this, um, after on the recording, you, this might be muted. So check out a couple of these. This is, uh, just a couple seconds of Mintaka Suite, um, from... Now, Chris's touch is beautiful, always, right? Like he's such a beautiful, soulful approach. Yeah, he is. I hate to I, talk over it, but. Ah, it's okay. Everyone does it to me all the time. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> bass players, but I'm bummed. But, uh, yeah, like, if you listen, I would actually say what's cool to do is go listen to this version with the string quartet. But go listen to the solo version from Prairie Modern as well. I'd say listen to that first and then listen to this. Like this section we're listening to, completely written for the album. Does not exist in the, this is why it's called Mintaka Suite, whereas on the previous album it was just Mintaka. Mintaka. Yeah, cool. yeah. Oh, thank you, Brendan. He said he'd never talk over me. And I wouldn't talk over you either, Brendan, because you're an awesome bass player, so. Uh, I mean, the, the writing in this is beautiful. I, I can tell you then, so you'd say Mintaka Suite, get them to check that out. I but you haven't say, got to the fun part. You got to get to the percussion part. Let's get to that part. Let's just keep talking over it. So, <laughs> he actually, one of the things we didn't record, we really wanted to, is he really got into the fact Ravel had written one string quartet. And he used that as fuel. And he wrote like a, it was like a 23 minute long string quartet that we didn't play on. And it was amazing, and it sounded like Ravel. Like, here we go. Here we go, Chris, start it up. He's one of the most rhythmic players I've ever played with. Yeah, Josh, it's on uh, iTunes and on Spotify. Or you can go talk to Chris because you're in Edmonton. You know where he is. Here we go. Here's the Latin part. Cute. That's all string quartet making that drum. And Chris, when you listen to this, you can hear Chris's inspiration. He was huge into Chucho Valdez. 
and he plays uh, uh, he played with a group called Bumba out of Edmonton for years Cuban music and then has a group right now that just won a Western Canadian Music Award two years ago called Montuno West this is a fantastic track yeah. I mean the, I, this, yeah. this whole record is fantastic there's there's the uh, this one this one is one of my favorites Wilds because of the I love the writing at the beginning in the string quartet, and this is my favorite solo of yours on this album. Oh. So, so check out this record, uh, check out Wilds. Um, I can honestly say, I mean, you know I'm a standards fan, so easy, you have one, just one standard, I believe, on here, just easy easy to love, and I yeah, love and that, that song. And uh, that one Dr. was Bell. actually, that was, that was a, yeah, that was a song that we had done in concerts, but we weren't really sure what we were going to do with, and then we had Dr. Bill from Madison Hat, a lovely individual who supported a lot of artists and uh, he wanted to support the album. And so um, the song that we felt would really fit him was was that we, uh, Chris had written a song for his wife on our previous album called The Essence of Beauty, Truth and Life. So not a, not a heavy title at all. That was a beautiful like, solo uh, ballad for his wife that uh, she said always reminded her of the crow's nest past. But one of the things about Chris and his writing, which when I write too, I strive for is, is melody, melody, melody. So, mm -hmm. you know, obviously we like to play with odd meters, shifting meter music, but if the melody isn't there, so that's, that's kind of one of the fun things when you listen to those albums is, is listen to some of the rhythmic stuff. And especially with Carl, Carl is such an astounding drummer. And um, he really was bringing a New York aesthetic to what we were doing. And he was very, you know, the most aggressive drummer I've ever played with, um, who at the same time, it's hard to say, the busiest drummer I've ever played with who leaves so much space. So. Well put. Yeah. He's extremely musical. Um, mm -hmm. And that's he, that trio is everyone's always listening to each other. So the Hutchinson Andrew trio, the, you're Cody Hutchinson. Uh, I am. Obviously, Chris Andrew is Chris Andrew. And okay. so uh, Carl Schwanick is trio? He's trio. Yeah. Okay, cool. Um, so hat for short. What is next for the hat? The hat, um, we are looking at, we took a bit of a hiatus. Chris went to get his master's degree in Auckland, New Zealand, which he just finished. Uh, Chris, or uh, Carl, we did an album with Carl last year. He did a um, 10 years from his first recording as a leader. He did uh, an album with the same band, same producer, and a few of the same tunes to get a take on what did we, you know, what did we sound like 10 years ago? What do we sound like now? And um, so what did 21-year-old Carl sound like versus 31-year-old Carl? Mm -hmm. And so it's called Reinventions, and it was nominated for Western Canadian Music Award last year, I think. Um, so we did that, that, that album basically it was the trio plus Brent Moss, saxophone player based in Vancouver. Mm -hmm. Um, and then, uh, we ended, uh, up kind of taking a break because Carl is doing his doctorate in business right now mm -hmm. at mm -hmm. the university of Calgary, got his MBA from Cambridge, um, partially did his doctorate in music at USC. Like Carl is it's next level man uh and then uh chris did his masters he's chris has a brand new album i have the mastered files sitting on my computer um he's a solo album coming out this year oh in excellent fall. what's and it gonna be called uh i don't know the name yet um okay. and that'll be on the uh the chronograph yeah excellent. and then uh chris and i are planning um on the birthday of the late great tommy banks who chris andrew uh, moved to Alberta to study with, but Did there's a good teach? story there because yeah, I remember yeah. I was I was on tour with Chris in on Vancouver Island and we were going by where Chris grew up in Campbell River and I said so what made you move to Edmonton to study music and he said well I moved to study with Tommy Banks and I said oh as you know Tommy was a hero of mine and I said that must have been. Um, amazing what was that like he goes i don't know he i never got to study with him he because he wouldn't he, teach he, he wouldn't teach he well he was at the college and then he left right when the year that chris came and and he said so i never i never got to study with him but i can say that obviously chris loves tommy but tommy spoke extremely highly and con uh, constantly and, and and consistently of chris's and point. chris chris never I don't know if Chris ever really took it as seriously as Tommy meant it. Tom, Tommy didn't offer up compliments just 
to make you feel good. No. If he said something, he meant it. Um, yes. And that, you know, like you and I both um, near the end of his life were really uh, fortunate to be mentored in different ways by Tommy. Um, you know, Tommy really liked the business aspect of what I was doing and was mentoring me in that and asking us to help him with that. And you know, with you were doing playing and writing with him and all these different things. Tommy was just so giving, but um, he many, many times and, and his family has also verified this had basically said, Chris Andrew was his favorite piano player. Period. Oh, and so he's, he said it so many times. And every time Chris just thought, oh, no, no, you're just saying that. And I'm like, no, Tommy legitimately thinks you're his favorite piano player. And, and one of the things I think you knew this is um, just before he passed. So we recorded an album with Al Muirhead. Um, it was uh, his Jun Juno nominated album, Undertones, um, from last year. Uh, that was recorded in 2018. Uh, just early in the new year in 2018 and it was supposed to be a a, a, a sextet not a, a quintet with tommy yeah with tommy and tommy was and also for anyone listening check out uh al muirhead undertones and it, al is playing bass trumpet yeah uh, al from the the calgary jazz orchestra for those listening that are cgo fans he's playing bass trumpet on the whole record with an incredible band out of toronto but but tommy was supposed to play he was supposed to be the pianist for that album and then as we know tommy um got very sick and passed very early in that year just literally a month before we went into the studio but what was was really uh you know we had on the books as well for that is i had spent three years uh pestering tommy because um, I, I know his catalog very well. I know his albums. I know his music. I've played with him many times as a view. And he he never, to me, because when you play with Tommy Banks, you feel like you're playing like a different type of player, very similar in the world of Oscar Peterson. Yeah. And and so I just kept bugging him. I'm like, man, like Tommy, you know, you don't have a trio album. You don't have like that that thing that really just says – this is what Tommy Banks is. And I kept bugging him and bugging him. And, and he, that year, uh, before he knew he was sick, um, in 2017, he had finally agreed. It blew me away. He's like, well, Cody, I, I think I'll go ahead and do this album that you've suggested. What do you have planned? And so we, what we had planned was Al Muirhead was going to record his album. Then we were going to keep Neil Swainson, world-class bass player, and Ted Warren, world-class drummer. We were going to keep them over and do a trio album with Tommy. And mm -hmm. so that album never got done. So where this long story is going is Chris and I were like, that album never got done. You are his favorite piano player. Let's do a trio album in tribute to Tommy. Yeah, it's lovely. And so we're going to record it on um, a live stream on his birthday in uh, December this year. And uh, that's the goal. And we will we'll probably do a couple of sessions after that. And we're going to release an album in tribute to Tommy, where it's the Hutchinson Andrew trio doing. And, and this has been the interesting thing for Chris and I, because Hutchinson Andrew, I think you could say our music is more on the contemporary side of things. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we're more in, uh, we've been more inspired, like players like Taylor Eggstein and Aaron Parks and uh, Brad Meldow, things like that. So and, and then odd and shifting meter music. And then Tommy is coming out of more of that traditional straight ahead school. And so this has been the debate we've been having is, so would Tommy like it if we did, you know, just straight ahead? Or would Tommy like it if we did a twist on what he does? And uh, what it came down to is Chris was just like, I want to play what Tommy does. And so this will be the first time that Hutchins and Andrew that we're going to do a straight ahead album. So, Excellent. That'd yeah. be nice. I can't wait to hear that. Mm -hmm. Wow, very cool. Um, okay, I got a couple quick questions for you. You, uh, uh, we've talked about it a bit, but you also run a record label with your wife Stephanie. Um, yep. And where can people find more information to follow your artist roster? Chronographrecords.com. There we go. Um, and uh, who would win in a fight, uh, you or your wife Stephanie? <laughs> You know the answer to that. That's true. Okay, what if she was asleep and wasn't allowed to use her arms? She would still kill me. Yeah, she really would. Okay, so you were the radio host for the show on CKUA uh, called The Time for Jazz, which is uh, ckua.com. You can listen around the world. Uh, 6 to 8 p.m. Mountain Daylight Time. Uh, as um, And how many years have you been on air with the CKUA? Uh, May 5th. 5th, 2012. Cool. So I guess technically I just did my ninth anniversary. 
So nine years, uh, 11 years if you're bad at math. Um, now, there, there are two great sides to your radio show uh, from my perspective. Um, one of the things I like about it is um, you, you play a range of jazz music from iconic players, players we've heard of um, through history, uh, to current players in the scene, uh, first focusing on Canadian players being Canadian-based, um, and then beyond, uh, just into everything that sounds amazing. Um, but you also do that from the perspective uh, of a professional musician. I love that. The second thing I really love is, uh, is you interview so many musicians. Everybody who has a project coming out that, uh, that really should be, should be focused, should be uh, you know, heard. And, uh, so, and some of these interviews you've done are so awesome. How many interviews have you conducted? Uh, not as many this year. I've been, cause I've moved and. But over nine years, yeah. how many well, roughly? I don't know. I'll say 10 a year. 10 a year. So let's say we've got about 90 interviews that you've done. Yep. Um, you've, uh, you've interviewed, uh, Benny Green. That was an, I, I was there. I got to sit, sit during that one and listen. Made him cry. Yeah. Oh yeah. That's wait a minute. Um, sorry, Benny, <laughs> uh, Christian McBride, you've, you've, infl you've, 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 I've always people. wanted to have that radio, that radio show where I make every single guest cry because I get deep. That's really <laughs> what I wanted. <laughs> but we were talking about Ray Brown and he just was like, man, he got so in so deep into it. It was amazing. So, oh, but man. continue. Sorry. I well, the, okay. So you've got, you've got 90, uh, mix down interviews with all these incredible musicians and you finally just started podcasting from your amazing archive uh, so where can someone go to subscribe to your podcast and listen to these incredible um interviews that you've done uh well i have I've, i put a few out i actually have a plan to do some more interviews and start editing over the summer some of these together because like good i've got a couple like one was so, donnie mccaslin that because he and i you know, he recorded with us. So I, yeah. I, I have a little bit deeper conversation with him and he brought out some stuff. I'm like, nobody's ever gotten him to, to say that stuff. So it was, it was really quite, quite, quite astounding. So uh, it will be at my website. You can find a link. Um, it's on Apple podcasts. Okay. Um, Just under so, your name, Cody Hutchinson, Apple podcasts. What, and there's, what is it? <laughs> there's like a the, link at Cody Yeah. Yeah. There's okay. a link at Cody. If you can find the podcast, click them and they'll take you there. There's only, I think three or four up right now, but they'll, I'll be, I'll be populating that more regularly. I'm going to try at least right. minimum one a month. Um, so let's get people to follow you there and, and check those out. Cause they really are fantastic. And the way you mix them down and edit them is, is really, um, they're really in, intriguing and fun to listen to. Um, okay. Who was the favorite person you interviewed? Hmm. Donnie McCaslin. I, I've really yeah. loved Donnie because he's such a genuine person and he's, he's an interesting guy because, you know, he's a Grammy nominee. He is considered one of the top five sax players in the world. And he has, I don't know how to put it. There's some, there are musicians out there who know they're good, but they don't have an ego, you know? Um, so he's Donnie like was, he's a, yeah. who he is as a person as well. He's a very pure human being. Um, nice. with a very good heart and and he is one of the most just badass sax players I've ever met and uh, but as a musician so giving like hmm. anyone who plays with him and he you know when I I'll, I got to dig that interview up where he talks about uh, working with Dave he was on David Bowie's last album he's the musical record, director yeah. for Black Star mm -hmm. strangely enough the only number one album that David Bowie ever released was the one he released the day after he died. And if you haven't heard that, it, it's a very intriguing album, uh, Black Star. Not uh, for the faint of heart. No, no, no. It's an intense record. Um, yeah. And one of my, of course, I'm a Donnie McCaslin fan from his work with Maria Schneider, and you know how much oh, yeah. Maria Maria's influenced me and, and how much I love her music. Um, okay, what was the most awkward thing you did in an interview? <laughs> Christian McBride, without yep. a question. Yeah, you already know that. I do. Uh, so Christian McBride, um, I had done some serious research on Christian. Whom I, I love. He yeah, is one of my favorite bass players on earth. He's one of he's one of the greatest bass players alive. He's yeah. he's crazy what he can do on the instrument. So I was very excited to get him. And but I came up around the same time Christian did, and 
I, he, he used to be in Calgary all the time playing with his own groups and with Joshua Redmond's groups. Mm -hmm. And at the time in the press, he was quite often part of this movement called the Young Lions. So it was kind of this hearkening back to the 50s and everything. But everyone um, kept talking about Christian McBride in relation to Ray Brown. Now, Ray Brown, you know, is world-class player, different type of player. But I think Christian, from what I read, started to resent um oh someone found the podcast stuff for the, the link um christian i think resented a little bit being always cast in the shadow of ray brown and and i and i had read that so i even prefaced i and i and this is the thing in an interview save save the questions where you think things can go off the rails till the end <laughs> so you've got enough content so i did i got a great interview with him and then i said i, I prefaced it i said to him so christian I know, um, and I know that you're you're not kind of you know you and Christian. I can't remember how I worded. I was very careful, and I wrote it out, and I made sure that the way I said it was not saying, "Hey, you know, Ray Brown, you sound like Ray Brown." But I, I said to him, "I know a lot of people compare you to Ray Brown, and you you are not um, fond of that comparison for different reasons. Uh, but you did play on super bass um, these albums with Ray Brown and John Clayton, two two bass players who." They all kind of coming from that tradition of Ray Brown. So I said, you did get to meet him. You did get to play with him. Was in any way he a mentor of yours? And he just did not. Like, he was just stuck on. Someone brought up Ray Brown. Like, if he had a publicist, they probably should have sent me something saying, do not ask about Ray Brown. But he got really, really, for lack of a better term, pissy about it. And uh, he he was really crabby and I could hear it. And I was kind of like, Oh man, he's really going off the rails. So then I changed the topic and I talked about his big band album, which he had just gotten a Grammy for and his oh, wife was singing record. on it. And I looked up albums that he and his wife had been on. And it was the first album that he had recorded with his wife. And he was starting to kind of be a bit nasty to me. So I just said to him, so you, your, your big band album, that uh, that's the first First, I th to my knowledge, that's the first recording that you've done with your wife. That must have been fun. And he said, "Oh man, no, we play together all the time." And he and he starts going off about how no, like how much he plays with her and all this stuff. And I said, "So," and I just he walked into it. I just said to him, "So then, uh, so you didn't have fun recording with your wife then?" Oh no, you didn't. I did because he was oh. getting so nasty because he wouldn't answer the question. I said, that, you know, recording with your wife, that must have been fun. He's like, oh, no, well, I did this and this. We've done this and this and this and this and this. So it wasn't fun recording with your wife. And he just, I have it on tape. I, I'll, when I put that on a podcast, that one will probably go viral. Um, but <laughs> where he's just like, oh, no, 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 no. I, I love my wife. I love playing with my wife. I'm like, yeah, just listen to the question don't get well, mad he, at me because you uh, ray brown he'd probably laugh anyway he has such a great yeah. sense of humor and he's such a nice guy he, <laughs> not uh, that day he didn't i guess but, uh, <laughs> um, but and, you know this is the thing too i knew i was interview number six on a press docket that day and yeah. he had like assistants dealing with it and people patching them through and i get it people get tired and people get it angry. gets tiring it gets tough yeah yeah, yeah and he didn't and and what I heard what I saw in that was and this is the thing too you know when we have a conversation with someone where you maybe start a sentence uh, a certain way that maybe wasn't what you meant and the person just gets stuck on that they don't hear anything past that they're just stuck on it and it makes them mad or whatever and I think that's kind of what happened he got stuck on the first thing and then so when I started asking for questions past that Ray Brown section everything past that section he was really combative and it was and he wasn't listening to the questions per se he was just mad i brought up something that he and I, like i said i tried my best to say no i don't think this but i i know that this has been a comparison in your career da, 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 da. and he took it and that was kind of it he was stuck on that thing and he was not happy for the rest of the interview but uh yeah. well that's a shame but at least you got a good interview and you got to interview him he's amazing he's great he's um, great i love it yeah. so uh, uh, you know, we have a lot of people that might be listening. Oh, uh, Bryce Saunders. Hi, Bryce. Says familiar with that music school. He's he's talking about Auckland. He went to Auckland. He's a trombonist. Went to Auckland. Oh, fun. Yeah, hey, yeah. Bryce. Ron Hope Sampson from Edmonton is the head of the head of the program. Um, and Jim Brennan used to be. Yeah. Yeah, from Edmonton. Great sax player. Um. Well, Jim's in okay. Town. So what? Uh, he is now. Yeah. But um. So what? 
uh, uh, let's talk about the Calgary Jazz Orchestra. What was your favorite Calgary Jazz Orchestra show that you played? There've been a lot. I know it's hard to. Yeah, that's like uh, that's a lot. <laughs> that's a lot of. It's shows. a lot of shows. Yeah. Uh, what was my favorite one? There's, yeah, there was a lot. You know. Or is there a favorite song that you played, or feature that you've had? I will. I will say we did. I remember we did a Duke Ellington show where we did some really like quirky, different outside stuff where it wasn't where you would you would paste the shows that one half was one thing and then what the other half was a different thing, and you were um, you were careful to put the first half was the palatable. Um, we'll keep them here until the second half. Uh, and then the second half was maybe some music that might have been a bit more challenging that that uh, wasn't everyone's uh, cup of tea, which is so very CKUA, just so you know. It's like uh, someone said to me, hey, if I don't hate every fifth song you play on the radio, you're not doing your job. Oh, so, wow, yeah. yeah. Well, I think yeah. there's something, you as you, you and I both do, like when I'm programming a CJO show, and I know you do it with your CKUA shows, um, with the music you play, it's, it's here's stuff that you're going to really like. And then, and then I want people to go on a journey, but then th this is something that you might not have been exposed to, but it's really fun for the musicians to play. And the musicians are going to be really into this and mm -hmm. get some more variation for what we play. Um, but it's amazing when someone comes up to me after and they say the challenging song, as you put it, right, or something that's yeah. not as accessible. And then they come up and they go, that was their favorite thing. They'd never heard anything yeah. like that before. And Because we're all at different stages in our listening journey, you know, and, and there's periods of time where, um, I mean, the first time, I don't really want to admit it, but the first time I heard Kind of Blue, I didn't really like it. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I didn't dislike it, but I'd come from listening to all this swinging big band stuff with, uh, you know, screaming trumpet soloists and then and listening to a lot of Louis Armstrong, and I was like 15 or something. So um, I, I think, and then, and then when I'd heard Kind of Blue a few years later, it blew my mind, and I just loved it. It was the most beautiful yeah. thing, and I still love it. But um, Okay. Um, yeah, it's what, okay if you like jazz. <laughs> what do you, uh, okay, so CJO specific, what do you like about playing with the Calgary Jazz Orchestra? I just like being, I like being in groups where there is a history, where um, you can build on on that history. And, and like I said, I like conversational playing. I like playing with musicians who are listening to each other. Um, so, you know, developing that and working with players and shaping a sound as a group, which you don't get to do as much nowadays. Um, you know, you talk to our elders where, yeah, they did. They got to play seven nights a week and tour, tour with nine the months a group. year. Yeah. Same group playing, yeah. playing, you know, variations of the same music. Now it's, you know, if you get a three night run with anyone, it's considered amazing. Mm -hmm. Um, and it, most non-musicians maybe don't see that it takes you know, yeah, we can get together on stage and play and have fun, but to develop a conversation. And that's why I started started Hutchinson Andrew Trio was because I wanted a group that had growth and conversation and, and you know, a, a sound. And that's to me what, you know, the CJO is, is developed a sound and developing those those relationships musically, not, and not you know, personally, of course, but to me, the musical relationship is king. So um, good answer. You get a point. Uh, what is the craziest, silliest, funniest CJO moment or story that, that you have? Uh, anytime we play the old jazz festival backstage in the hair salon, things get crazy. Um, <laughs> the, the, there's a, there's a, so lot the of, room, a lot of photos. Yeah, the green room The green there. room when we tour to the old jazz festival, which is this incredible, uh, incredible event. But... Uh, but yeah, the, our green room at, at this great hall, this is a beautiful uh, theater, is is the is a college's. I think it's for the college, right? It's the college's um, hair salon training area. Yeah, is our green room, um, and there yeah. are wigs. Lots and lots of different kinds of wigs. Some are very um, unique. Yep, and there are musicians that are. Also unique. Getting excited. Adrenaline's yeah. going up. Uh, shenanigans ensue. Yeah. Um, okay. And uh, there's two members of the CJO, three members technically, that um, are, we'll call it follically challenged, uh, who do not have hair. And uh, 
two of the three of them are very open I believe, to the I believe concept Jim, of trying different Jim, hairstyles to see what they would Jim look like. Jim prefers to call and, it living a Bruce Willis lifestyle, I think is how. Yes, yes, yes Jim does say that. But uh, we definitely have some great photos uh, that I'm sure one day will be part of a CJO show in the background of our <laughs> bass trombonist and our drummer uh, really, really exploring the space. And... Uh, yeah. And it doesn't ha it doesn't hurt either because there's always like a, a Christmas or fall theater show that they're working on. So the, all the props and costumes are That's there. True. And, and uh, given the right circumstances, uh, sometimes you'll see some of the musicians with a new set of hair and uh, outfits that uh, to match. It's true. It's very true, yeah. um, which has actually happened backstage at a lot of uh, when we've played theaters with theater productions. And yeah. they're, you know, when the facade of show business, right? When you're, when, you know, for everyone listening, the backstage areas can be quite uniquely um, forgotten about. And so there can be the craziest props and oh, yeah. uh, items and things that you, because they were used for comedic value or some period piece or something. And w when you're waiting to go on stage, sometimes, yeah, sometimes adrenaline gets a little. I have a lovely cartoon, a uh, comic book set of a scene that was put together by saxophonist Mike Murley from Toronto. Oh, amazing um, when player. Hutchinson, or, uh, was it? No, it was Carl Schwannick Quartet was on tour. So the, when the Hutchinson Andrew Trio wasn't touring, we would be touring with Carl's group, which was the Hutchinson Trio plus either Remy Balduk on sax or Mike Murley or, or uh, Brent Ma on sax. And so we were in Cold Lake um, in Alberta at a high school ready to go do a concert where we were supposed to play for 500 cadets who were at the, the Air Force Base there. Mm -hmm. um, unbeknownst to us that that right before they were supposed to get on the buses and come to us, a senior officer at the Air Force Base just told all the cadets who had paid for a ticket to come to our show. Um, so we had 500 paid tickets for the show and not a single one of them showed up because the senior officer said, we're commandeering the buses, sorry, and they couldn't get to the show. <laughs> One officer showed up, and we had a theater for 500 people with one sold officer. Out. Sold out. Sold out. One officer and uh, a mom and her two kids. Um, and playing playing with Mike Murley, but um, th that was that that's was fun. So weird. I mean, the but backstage they had it was the the, the green room slash band room was also the guy who ran it, trained people on fire safety uh, and CPR. And so I don't know how it ended up that Chris was strapped into a bot, into one of those flat like stretcher backboard. boards, a backboard, backboards yeah. with a neck brace on. Uh, oh, it's because we said, "Hey, how does this work?" And the guy was so excited, he strapped Chris or uh, Mike Murley. So he strapped in Mike Murley into it, and uh, we took a bunch of photos. And Mike, unbeknownst to us, is really adept at he has a software to put together uh, comic strips. And he created a hilarious comic strip of how his tour was going in Western oh, Canada. Oh gosh, that's awesome! That and is he ended brilliant. up in a yeah in a board. Corey Weeds is on. What? There we go. Hey Corey. The uh, hey Corey, how you doing? Oh, and man? Wes Schellenberg. What are your, some of your favorite songs to play? I don't know why my favorite song to play with the Calgary Jazz Orchestra is "Love Me or Leave Me." Really? Yeah, that's cool. It's one of the few songs where I can drive the bus without anyone else playing. Dum, 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 yeah. dum, 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 and for me that's really fun dum, I'm like, dum, dum, dum. yeah because to me the bass it's like showing that yeah i don't need the drummer i don't need the i can drive a whole big band without any of you it's true and i uh that's one of my more favorite tourist uh arrangements i've done and and it's based around what you do because the drums are until really the end they don't even really he doesn't even the drummer doesn't really even get to the sticks it's just all yeah the bass yeah. players pushing it the whole time it's kind of like it's a for a bass player it's a test of your time and your feel yeah if, if, you, if you don't have it it's a big band is one of the most unforgiving things on earth to play time tone tone and the three t's tuning there it is um the uh and uh and corey man corey hope you're doing well um great sax you player Everyone's yeah. got it, man. Just just go on Spotify and check out Corey Weeds. It's amazing. His, yeah, his I think he's got uh, he's got something records. like no, no. I think uh, just under his own name, uh, I I counted something like he had put out in five years eight albums under his own name. You have a problem, Corey. Um, <laughs> but my favorite one is the Many Deeds of Corey Weeds, 
and it's got a picture it's like it speaks so well to his career i think on the front is him with his saxophone on stage at a club and he's got a baby strapped to his chest and he's playing <laughs> and his wife is yeah. sitting there and his wife is sitting there in a beautiful dress leaning against the wall looking at him like really <laughs> not impressed so, doing it yeah oh man yeah. um and we had uh we had uh uh, we had Corey come out with the, the CJO for our Ellington, one of our Ellington shows. I think our last Ellington show. Sure. Um, man, Corey, I hope you can come out and come out and play with us again. Yeah, next time um, you have to wear a different colored suit so people know you're a guest. <laughs> <laughs> okay, My wife so, looks naturally upset. That's amazing. So that's um, what Corey said. Nice. Um, okay, so uh, lightning round. Ready? Okay. Fast, 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 fast. Okay, if I got four of your former band leaders in a room together, what would they say about you? Jackass. Okay. Uh, sing a song that best describes you. Lonely, I'm so lonely and blue. Very, <laughs> from uh, Teen America World Peace, please. <laughs> okay, very, very nice. Um, if someone wrote a biography on you, what would the title be? What the title will be uh, things to things not to do to get people to stay, uh, or oh no, it'd be things things to do to get people to go to the bathroom, play the bass. So wow, to to get people to leave. Well, that's the joke. How to right? clear a room? Is that maybe the, I think that's the title. Yeah, yeah Cody yeah. Hutchinson. How to clear a room? Oh, the bass solo. I can go. Uh, I can go to the washroom now. That's the old joke. The uh, yeah. the, the okay. drums are playing. Everything's good. The drums are playing. Everything's good. The drum stopped. That's bad. Oh no! Drum stop mean bass it's solo. Bass solo. Right. Um, okay. So come on, more so, lightning rounds. Forty-two red. If Hollywood made How to Clear a Room into a movie, who should play you? Jack Black. Wow. Do you like Star Wars? Sure. Can you tell a joke? Uh, maybe. What is the coolest freaking car ever? I'm not into cars. How many bass players does it take to screw in a light bulb? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> oh, that's right. I do know. Uh, none. The piano player can do with their left hand. There it is. Um, what is the worst decision you have ever made musically? Oh, wow. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know if I've made, I've made a decision where I regret as a musician. Okay. Uh, what is the worst decision you've ever made? Oh, so many to choose from. <laughs> I don't know. My wife and I went to the grocery store today to buy an onion, and we walked out with $180 worth of groceries. I mean, that's just, that's that's just, just life. normal. But were they groceries, actual groceries, or was it like chips and cookies and – a uh, thing of sushi and snacks. A mix. A mix. Okay. Some groceries and some stupidity. My wife is probably eating a chocolate cake right now. Good for her. Good for her. Now I just want cake. Okay, so uh, Rob Leonard. Hey, Rob. Uh, just wrote in, hey, Cody, if you could play live with a jazz giant of all time, who would that be? I was thinking about this the other day. Um, I've gotten to play with a lot of the ones that I wanted to play with. Donnie McCallison was one. Um, I was thinking about it for singers. I would love to play with Gregory Porter one day. Mm -hmm. um, that would be like really cool for me. Drummers, I've gotten to play with some of my my heroes, like Quincy Davis. I've gotten to do a small tour with uh, piano players, like Chris Andrews, still my favorite piano player. But I've played with played yeah, I've gotten to play with some really amazing pianists. So I don't know. It's it's tough to say. Maybe I'd like to play with someone like Terrell Stafford. Uh, as you know, I got I got three and a half minutes of joy playing with the Lincoln Center Jazz Orchestra. That was like, yep. that have was it on fun. video. Yeah, that was fun. Yeah, so I don't know. It's it's kind of interesting being a, I guess being a a a, a, res, a respectable player in a smaller scene. I've gotten to play with some musicians that I have no business being on stage with. I've gotten to play with Joe Lovano. I've gotten to play with Ingrid Jensen multiple times. Uh, Walt Weiskopf. Like, yeah, yeah. I would love. I would love to do a, a small group gig with Corey Weeds, who go. is, in my estimation, one of the greatest players to ever pick up the horn. I hope you're still tuned in, Corey, because I'm Absolutely. not trying to kiss your butt right now. 
But no, he's an amazing player. I actually was thinking about that. I was like, oh, I'd love to play. I'd love to play with Corey a bit more. So there you go. Um, how would you sell me eggnog in July? It's eggnog. You don't have to sell it. It sells itself. <laughs> All right. Um, and how many that times? How many times a day do a clock's hands overlap? I don't know. Once, twice, 18, like I look at clocks. <laughs> um, and what ancient place would you like to go to? Something that existed in time that doesn't exist now. When in time would you like to go? Ancient. Interesting. Whoa. Old Divine Gorge when it was right, fresh, and new. I don't know. Wait, what? Old what? Exactly. There. You're, if you've got one paleontologist on the on here, they'll get it. They'll be, the dawn of man. Ah. What makes you angry? Oh, people with bad time and don't listen on stage. <laughs> okay, so I make you angry. Uh, what makes you happy? People with good time who listen and, on and stage. And listen on stage, yeah. Um, and uh, uh, who uh, who do you like best now? Who do you like best? My daughter. Uh, well, no, no, you, there's a choice, but good answer. My wife. That's, that's, that, was, that was a good answer too. Okay. If you could choose between... Paul Chambers or Leroy Vinegar? I could have bought Leroy Vinegar's bass if I had any money Ugh, when he passed. Ugh. I didn't really know much about Leroy other than I liked his playing. I would love to hang out with Paul Chambers, but I suspect it would be very dangerous because he died at, what, like 33 from alcoholism? Do you know how hard you have to drink to, to just purely die of that? I actually like, don't know. Yeah, that's it's pretty intense. Uh, I, you know, I think it would be interesting, and I'd ask Paul about his bass with the nice little happy lady, ladies scroll on the scroll of his neck. So there you go. Um, I love. I mean, I, I love both those players, but I I love Leroy Vinegar because of I, I first heard him playing with Chet Baker. Mm. Um, okay, so right at the end here, describe yourself in seven words or less accurately. Tall, graying, <laughs> overscheduled. Uh, it's a hyphenated word, but I'll give it to you. Smart ass. Hyphenated. Dude, hyphenated. I'll give it to you. Um, yeah. Tired and uh, itching to play. That's three words, though. Uh, yeah. But maybe you also are bad at math. Yeah. Um, awesome. Is there anything else you'd like to say to anyone, Cody, before we sign off? No, I just wanted to say thank you very much for having me. Um, great to see some people popping in on here. And uh, Corey, come on now. Come on now, Corey. And you should all go check out. I think Corey is uh, on Jazzcast. You can listen to his shows. And this guy is Condition literally – Yeah, Condition mm -hmm. Blue. He is a living encyclopedia of all things – Hard bop and yeah, like Corey is Corey is go check out Solo Live Records. Let's, That's let's, all I'm gonna say. Let's make a record. You, me, um, Ted Warren, maybe Jody uh, or not Jody, uh, maybe um, uh, maybe Chris Andrew and Corey, and let's call it "Come On Now." Come on now! Come on now! Two exclamation <laughs> points! Thanks everyone for tuning in and uh, live, and check us out as uh, these are archived and they're starting uh, the podcast hasn't gone up yet but it'll go up and i'll put a link um and uh send in your uh, questions and anyone you'd like to, to join us we have a roster coming up for the rest of the summer of the the musicians of the calgary jazz orchestra and maybe Corey will you'll join me for one of these and and we'll uh i'll try to keep it going as much as i can when things open up so thanks so much for cody thank you so hey, much thank cody, you and it looks like cory says he's in now he's the in. Base Based off of the delay, he's in. He's in on the album and probably the podcast too. Pro yeah, yeah, yeah. Or it's just one or the other, and he's regretting not being specific. No, no. Corey's like another album. I get to record another one. I've only like, done. I don't want to do another in album. The last or, five years, I'd love to I do an album. More. I just don't want to come and talk to you. It's it's one yeah. of these. Yeah, that's um, fine. I don't want to talk to people. <laughs> uh, thanks so much, everyone. Have a great night. And we'll see you next week when I have a guest saxophonist and a friend of ours, the great Jerry A. Bear. I'm going to talk about his career and uh, his approach to the saxophone, his approach to 
especially being he's one of the the best uh, saxophone section, alto one section leaders I've, I've ever worked with. And he's developed that over years and years and years with the Calgary Jazz Orchestra. So we're, we're Nobody can that. snap even close to as loud as he can. And, and how he snaps. So it's unbelievable. I don't know how he doesn't tear his skin off. It's amazing. Like it, it starts to hurt when you really dig in. It's oh, got to yeah. be, it's technique. It's, it's got to be the same, right? It's hand shape, yeah. like playing the bass and technique. And you have so, to ask him about the, the original pronunciation of his name from Fort McMurray. All right. Thanks so much for listening tonight and join us next week, 7 p.m. Friday night, Mountain Daylight Time. Uh, here always we'll do the live stream on Facebook. And like I say, they'll start to pop up on the podcast after. Have a great night, everyone. Thanks, Johnny.